industrial revolution how it all began so let's start with this journey now understanding how and what were the key factors when we talk about industrial revolution so the first important thing was technology definitely it was technology that changed the scenario from an agricultural revolution to an industrial revolution so what happened during this time was there was invention of steam engine which was one of the major uh, developments we would say steam power which led to firstly the role in mining and later on in industries as we'll understand later then you had machinery moving from hand work from hand looms to power looms as simple as that was the basic idea where role of machine got improved and with this there was mass scale production so rather than producing one piece of cloth which used to take 10 days 10 pieces of clothes were produced in one day so that was mass production now definitely when there is mass production what is important is market so what comes next is transportation to transport the goods firstly the raw material and secondly the finished products to and from the destination so exports and imports and transport was vital for trade to survive the next was as industrial revolution grew you had greater disparities disparities in terms of rich and poor that started to originate we'll understand that in a while in detail more women and children were engaged in work so child labor was something that became a major issue during the industrial revolution we'll come to these all these points in further details as we progress in the class and finally when these things went beyond the capacities of common man there were protests that started across the region where industrial revolution started so what was the basic idea about industrial revolution so the term industrial revolution was firstly given by two major persons uh, george michael and frederick engels now both of them were european scholars michael was a scholar from france and engels from germany so he was from france and he was from germany both of them tried to explain how industrial revolution was revolutionizing the life of common man later on it was philosopher and economist who was tony p who started explaining the changes that industrial revolution brought and he was there during the reign of king george iii and since then he was explaining how british industrial development during 1760s to mainly 1820s was very very important and how things slowly and gradually started to taper down later on and then you had t s ashton along with montox and hosbaum who were talking about a clear sweep of gadgets and the world of gadgets so it was a complete revolution in itself now why britain was one of the major centers for industrial revolution now britain was a region which was affected mainly by the agricultural revolution now what happened under uh, the unification that started in the region of scotland so there was a common market a common law a common currency that was across the region of britain now this was one of the major things that led to agricultural revolution revolution in the sense that smaller land parcels were being put together and people were employed there now when people were employed in a larger piece of land what happened was there was lot and lot of landless farmers that were there now when there were small chunks let's say there were five small chunks people were occupied in each of the chunks when there was consolidation of these chunks as a single unit what happened was few people who did not own the land or who did not had the land and who were uh, doing very basic jobs were slowly and gradually expelled out of agriculture so what happened in the rural areas of britain a lot of 
landless farmers were moved out of agriculture they lost their jobs they lost their livelihoods now what to do so the thing was these people were moved to urban areas so there was a huge migration from rural area to urban area and when they came to the urban area the most important thing that was witnessed was the industrial revolution so it was a whole journey from agricultural revolution to industrial revolution as we can see and out of the 19 european cities that were there between uh, let's say 70s 50s to 1800s you had 11 of them which were in britain so of the total 19 cities in europe 11 were lying in britain and therefore we say britain became the epicenter of this industrial revolution one of the largest of its kind now when it comes to britain as we said why it is important we need to understand that first of all vicinity to the coastal area so you had a triangular trade now what was the triangular trade trade between europe where it was then you had the west indies the island groups closer to americas and then africa so there was a kind of triangular trade that existed and this triangular trade along with good network of rivers later on development of canals as we would see formation of market centers so goods were brought here raw material was brought here finished product was made and there was market opportunities along with a very very strong banking system that evolved because they had a common currency and since they had market they were trying to trade now when they were trying to trade banking system definitely needs to be strong so four important things that came into light was firstly as a market center as a center for triangular trade as a, a region where you had lots of rivers and navigable routes and then you had a strong banking system now when it comes to banking system bank of england was one of the strongest financial systems that were established back in 1694 then later on hundreds of provinces in england witnessed banking system and a strong banking system and nearly 600 banks were there in different provinces and only in london there were more than 100 banks that were present during that time of industrial revolution so banking system was a very very important component many people who were traveling from village areas to the urban areas settled down in the urban areas started with their job and therefore uh, they were given loans for uh, might be let's say setting up of industries or taking home so there were various kinds of loans that were granted by the bank and banking system also led to financial stability in the region of britain so that was one of the major things the next important thing in britain was the series of inventions there were more than 26000 different inventions that took place however more than half of those inventions have been li uh, listed in a mere period of 1762 to 1800 that is in merely 40 years there were nearly 13000 inventions in different fields that took place however what today we will talk about is the four major transformations or the four major inventions in different fields that changed the life and brought in what is called as industrial revolution as of now so those were coal and iron the changes with cotton the spinning and the weaving the next is the development of railways and development of steam power so transportation railways and canals we would understand both of those steam power uh, development with power looms and then uh, coal and iron which was one of the which is as of now one of the core industries and the building blocks for various other industries so the basic requirement for any industry to start so let's start with the coal and iron now coal and iron let's understand this europe was unique why let's understand this because in this map if you can see you have lots and lots of 
coal fields that are seen so the region which is marked in orange here is the coal field and the region which is marked with gray circles is the iron ore so there is huge proximity between iron and coal now firstly there is proximity so transportation cost is less secondly these seams which were present here were very very rich in coal and iron and as a result you had lots and lots of iron extraction that took place now iron when it is extracted from the ore in a pure form it is known as smelting now this process of smelting is very very important initially charcoal was used for it now when charcoal was used for uh, the process of smelting there were few drawbacks related to charcoal firstly it was fragile it cannot generate very high temperature it produces lots and lots of impurities which in turn leads to poor quality of iron production that takes place and for this a lot of forest area must be destroyed so that was one of the shortcomings that was witnessed with charcoal so slowly charcoal was replaced by coking coal now coking coal was interesting because the amount of impurities coming from coking coal was very very less you had very few uh, amount of sulfur impurities that were there it could generate higher temperature which was not the case with charcoal so coking coal was much much preferred as compared to charcoal the most interesting thing that we would understand today now is the derby family now this family is known as abraham derby a trio of grandfather father and son all three of them named as abraham derby abraham derby first was the one who invented coking coal and then this trio's invention the three of those the grandfather father and son all of those inventions were related to metallurgical industry and therefore was very very revolutionary so abraham uh, derby first was the one who used coke in the blast furnace now when he used coke it was able to generate higher temperature lesser impurities and led to finer castings and larger castings so the castings that were made of iron were much much fine much much better and much much bigger so that was the contribution of first abraham derby now the second abraham derby focused on wrought iron or pig iron uh, and he separated wrought iron from pig iron so wrought iron he said was less brittle as compared to pig iron and there was a kind of development that was made in the types of iron which could be used for different purposes during this time there were two important people one were henry cort now henry cort during this time uh, focused on puddling furnace now his puddling furnace and rolling mill two of his inventions are very very important and in this what he did was steam power was used to roll the purified iron into bars so the iron was rolled into bars and that was used for construction and that was one of the major uh, inventions of henry cort during this time similarly you had john wilkinson's now wilkinson's development was also important wilkinson made first chairs of iron he used iron for uh, transporting water so water was transported not through the pvc pipes as of now but through the iron pipes in the city of paris there were uh, iron which was used in distilleries beveries and many other places so that was wilkinson's contribution then came the derby 3 so the third abraham derby's contribution was important in the sense he built this first iron bridge of the world now his first iron bridge of the world was built on river severn now that is one of the major rivers of england was one of the major rivers of england during that time and later on it was known as the iron bridge area so that is how the town got the name and that was indeed a very important discovery because 
it was connecting two different regions with the help of a iron bridge so that was the development that was marked during the time of derby and the trio was known for their metallurgical inventions and this is how we could say iron and coal basically transformed the life during the industrial revolution the next important thing about britain as we said was britain was rich in coal as well as iron and both of them were in proximity that means they were present close to one another and as a result the transportation cost was much much low iron industry in britain got its production nearly four times from the period of 1800 to 1830 so there was four times the previous production that was witnessed in iron and steel also so much production was there that ultimately it became one of the cheapest places in europe to produce iron and steel and as a result most of the consumption across Europe for iron and steel started to come from Britain. So there need to be good transport system and for that you had canals and railways that started to develop. So transportation was another important thing that was developed during that time. Now if we go on to the development within the field of iron and coal, it is interesting to see to produce one ton of pig iron you had 8 tons of coal that was required initially back in 1820s but by 1850s this 8 ton of coal was replaced by merely 2 tons. So there was lesser amount of coal that was required in the process and slowly and gradually Britain became one of the major smelting centers as well because of the lesser use of coal better proximity to the coal fields and higher production that was witnessed now as you can see in the map there were canals that were developed all of these canals were lying closer to the areas of coal and iron the only aim during that time for building these canals was to transport these heavy bulky material from one side to another so let's say from coal plant to an iron plant so that transportation used to take place through canals or from iron to a place where the production was taking place but again if you see in the map the industrial location were very very limited there were few major centers like you had Liverpool, Manchester, Newcastle, then you had the region of Birmingham and Gasplow. So those were the some of the major centers which were the centers for industrial growth. It was not the whole of the Britain which was part of the industrial revolution. Again, very, very important to note. We'll understand this as we'll proceed further. Now, similar to this, if we move to the cotton, you had major manufacturing centers which are marked here in the map. Now, in the map, as you can see, gas flow. Then again, the area of Manchester, Sheffield, Nottingham, Leicestershire, Birmingham were some of the major areas. Now, these areas were super positioned, if you could see both the maps with each other. So, most of the epicenters of production were more or less common and the cities which were emerging were more or less common. Now, when it comes to cotton, as we said, Britain initially had wool and wax flags sorry two of the things that were used for production later on they moved to cotton but they did not have their indigenous cotton so they were importing bales of cotton cloth from india processing it in britain and then exporting it again to the colonies so it was indeed a very good process of colonization that was going on as the east india country uh, east india company started to gain control over india and parts of india we saw that there were a significant uh, raw material that was transported from the various regions of india now back in the early 18th century there was a lot of gap between the weavers and uh, the spinners so basically there were 10 spinners and when 10 spinners were working together they could process it for one weaver 
So the threads were processed for one weaver when there were 10 spinners working for it. So what was happening? There were spinners working day in and day out. On the other hand, we were sitting idle waiting for the thread to come from the spinners until the time it does not arrive, they did not find any work. So there was a large disparity that existed. But technology closed this gap. Now, with technology coming up, there was quicker production that was seen with the spinning mill. And when there was quicker production with the spinning mill, weavers, not sit, weavers were not sitting idle. So that was again an important development. Later on, you had power looms that developed and slowly and gradually what happened was the cotton, which was one of the things that was produced in the households was slowly and gradually transferred to the industries. So the people, the household small scale industries engaged in it were slowly and gradually losing their jobs. Now, what was the development in the cotton industry? Now, cotton industry was indeed remarkable because there was significant development that was seen as a part of British industrialization. The first was the flying shuttle loom. Now, this was developed by John Kay. It helped weaver weave in broader fabrics in less time and there was consequently more yarn that was generated and that was one of the major developments. The next was the spinning jenny. Spinning jenny was developed by James Hargivis. Now this was uh, one of the inventions where rather than thousands of people engaged in spinning or hundreds of people working with spinning, a single person could do a similar amount of tasks that was done by numerous people. So a lot of job shortage or job cut started to take place. The next was water frames by Arkwit. Now Arkwit developed the water frames which was developing much more stronger threads than before. So the quality of the thread was much more strong. It was much more durable and it was also a possible to weave in pure fabrics rather than the combination of linen and cotton that was done so far. The next was development of an interesting machine which was known as Mule. It was developed by Samuel Crompton and it was allowing uh, spinners to have better quality yarn with much more finer material that was seen and finally the power loom which was developed by Edmund Cartwright. Now Edmund Cartwright and many of these people are very very important. We'll understand how these discoveries took place in a while so just hold on for that. But here power loom was very very interesting because with a single switch off and switch on of the machine it was a sudden break in the production that could take place and a huge amount of production was possible because of it so definitely it was one of the major developments that was witnessed so that was about the cotton the next we said was steam power. Now steam power was initially used in the mining industries. Uh, you had water which had been for centuries being used as hydraulic power because it is reliable, it is less expensive and it has a capability to generate very high temperature. So steam can generate very high temperature and as a result with high temperature, the energy that's coming in, huge amount of machineries can run. So tremendous power exists with the steam. The only issue with the steam was it was bulky and it required lots and lots of uh, high temperature that was to be uh, maintained. So there was lots and lots of uh, equipments and stronger equipments that were required. So what was the application in the mining? Now when it was mining, Initially, that was there was less of coal and iron production, but slowly as Britain became one of the centers, the demand across Europe started to go up and to meet this growing demand, people in Britain had to dig deeper and deeper. Now, when they were deep, uh, digging deeper, they were either uh, flooding 
which was one of the major issues that was witnessed in the mines. So what was used was steam power to bombard deeper. Now when there was steam power that was used to bombard deeper, this idea was developed by Thomas Savvy who developed what was known as uh, a steam engine which was known as miner's friend and this used to drain the mines. So go deeper into the mines, drain more of coal and iron for the requirements but there were few drawbacks associated to it. Firstly, they were very primitive technologies. So the engine used to work very, very slow. They could not go very, very deep. And if there was too much steam pressure, the boiler used to burst. So that was one of some of the major drawbacks that were witnessed. However, later on, you had Thomas Newcomb who developed a steam engine which again had a defect of losing energy due to continuous cooling of the uh, cylinder, the condensing cylinder that was required because so much heat was produced, it was re required to regularly cool it down. Otherwise, there could be a problem similar to what was faced by the miner's friend. So that was what was a uh, new comb discovered. But later on, you had James Watt, whose invention has been known by most of you. And James Watt developed his machine in 1769 and this converted uh, pumps into movers. So whatever work of the steam power was used for pumping could now also be used as movers to move power machines on factory floors. So this was where steam power was actually used in factories. So moving only from the mining industry, steam power was now used in factories as well. Again, the idea of James Watt was then pushed forward by one of the wealthy uh, industrialist Matthew Bolton and along with Matthew Bolton, James Watt created what was known as Soho Foundry in Birmingham. Now this Soho Foundry started to produce lot of steam engines and the demand of the steam engine slowly and gradually increased. By the end of 18th century, you had steam engines which were now replacing the normal hydraulic power that was used so far. So after 1800s, the steam engines that were uh, developed were much more lighter, had stronger metals, had condensing systems and also were based on scientific knowledges, uh, scientific knowledge not like the previous ones. By, by 1840, nearly 70% of the total energy that was used was coming through steam power. So slowly and gradually steam power was replaced by what was known as horsepower. Now you might wonder what is horsepower. So horsepower during that time was actually the power that was seen by the horse. So there is no wonder why it is called as horsepower. So horsepower was the power of the horse which by which a horse could lift nearly 33,000 pounds one foot in one minute. So that was defined as the horsepower and this horsepower was one of the major mechanical units uh, or the units of mechanical energy during that time. And as we said, this horsepower was replaced by the steam engines and the steam power. Now coming on to transportation, as we said, two major elements under transportation one is the canal and other is the railway now canals were very very important in close proximity so the first canal that came was the worsley canal and this worsley canal was a canal which was developed by james brindley and james brindley developed this canal to carry coal from the coal deposit areas to the city where the production was taking place near manchester and with the help of this canal, there was quicker movement of the coal. Coal being bulky, it required a lot of manpower. And because of this quicker movement, the cost of coal was cut down to half. So they were able to produce in a cheaper fashion. The next was, uh, this was much, much more faster than roadways. So canals 
started to grow and develop mainly for those commodities which were bulky which had a lot of weight the transportation became very very easy now city of birmingham was very very important as we saw city of birmingham had a unique system of canal connections these canal connections were along the london bristol canal then you had the humber and the mersey rivers flowing through this region and there was a period which was known as canal mania so canal mania means people were, got manic about the uh, the development of canals and there were huge number of canals that were built in a period of around 60 years 4000 miles of canals were built in britain itself but later on what happened was the scenario changed with so many canals being developed there was lot of congestion because lot of transport was taking place through canal so congestion in the canals started also these canals did not remain functional when there were floods coming in or when there was drought so there has to be a navigable river in order to function as a canal if there is no navigable path the transportation is not possible so there was an immediate requirement to shift so where did they shift it they shifted to locomotive now railways was the thing they shifted to initially the railway tracks were built of iron later on they were shifted to wooden tracks and with the steam engine and the discovery of steam power as we already said this path became much much cheaper and much much cost effective as compared to canals and roadways so there was enormous development of railways that started now the first development was seen in 1801 when richard tervick designed an engine which was known as the puffing devil so it pulled the trucks around the mine uh, in the region of conwell and that was what was his initial discoveries later on one of the railway engineers george stephenson constructed the first locomotive which was known as bulcher butler and that was having a uh, uh, basically a uh, that was having an ability to pull a weight of nearly 30 tons at a speed at a hill uh, at a hill slope of 4 miles per hour so that was how this development started now later on similar to the canal mania that we saw you had railway mania that developed and slowly and gradually more than 9500 miles of railway network was seen across britain and most of the england by 1850 was connected with railways but this development did not stop in england itself or in britain itself wherever britain had the colonies across the globe development of railways started so the first uh, railway line that was established in 1825 was between stocking uh, stockton and darlington and later on you had railway lines which were connecting major centers of production which were liverpool manchester and there were speed that was significantly increasing the first railway line between stockton and darlington had a speed of only uh, 24 km per hour later on you had a speed up to 50 km per hour that was witnessed so there was definitely a significant change now what we would be coming to is yet another aspect that you might be wondering about most of the inventions that took place during the time of industrial revolution was not the brain of the scientist so that is a real myth that most of you have it was only and only the hidden talent and the creative power of the people that led to these inventions and discoveries the basic education of science physics chemistry mathematics was lagging during that time only after certain amount of inventions were already done people started to develop interest in education and even uh, smaller towns in the regions of britain started to study and there was a a, a, a we could say a whole a uh, drive for knowledge that started after the industrial revolution or towards the end of the industrial revolution now let's talk about some of the examples for cotton we talked about john case uh, flying shuttle and james hargreaves spinning jenny 
and both of them were weavers and carpenters they had nothing to do with sciences similarly richard arquet was a barber and a wig maker samuel crompton was not at all technologically skilled you had thomas survey who developed the miner's friend as the first uh, steam power based machine a steam engine to dig or drain mines was an army officer thomas newcomb was a blacksmith and a locksmith similarly james watt had a strong mechanical bent he had a strong uh, thirst for uh, literature but he never assumed himself to go for the discovery of steam engine similarly the person who was most involved during that time for building the road projects across britain john metcalf was blind still he had a huge amount of creativity similarly was the canal project that was laid down the first canal worsley canal developed by james brindley as we discovered uh, as we studied james brindley was illiterate he could not even spell the word navigation and still he was able to develop the so called present day canal system and the era of canal mania during the industrial revolution period in britain so it was his creativity imagination and his thought power that actually revolutionized these ideas during that time people used to discuss ideas at coffee shops and there were traveling lectures that were done so people who were trying to invent something who were trying to move or think out of the box develop creativity were having discussions with common people at coffee houses gathering ideas and while traveling they were trying to get in more ideas and more thoughts and societies of arts were much more dominant during that time so that is again as we said a very very important concept that we need to understand but there was a changing life scenario as we saw people were moving from the agricultural revolution that took place from the rural areas to the urban areas and in the urban areas what happened was there was a clear distinction between the rich and the poor the poor used to live near the uh, industrial areas however the rich people used to move towards the suburb region where they could find fresh air clean water however the poor who were living closer to the factories had to live in very unhygienic unhealthy condition lack of sanitation and as a result you had huge amount of uh, epidemics that were witnessed during the industrial revolution these were mainly in the form of typhoid cholera and the cholera of 1832 was one of the largest killers in london which killed nearly 31000 people in london itself a very significant proportion of the population during that time in the villages people were actively engaged they were rearing their livestock gathering their food spinning their uh, spinning uh, working on the spinning wheels producing the thread but those who were working in the urban areas had to devote long hours on factory were not allowed to take leaves they had to work continuously and had to do the same kind of work under very very pathetic and uh, deadly conditions in some of the cases and if they were not able to meet the targets there were stringent punishments that were given to them what happened during this time people started to think that the industrialists basically who were trying to generate capital out of it started to think if we are employing more of men there is more agitation so what they started to do was rather than employing men into industries they brought in women and children into industries reason being they were ready to work on low wages firstly secondly they were less uh, agitating so there were less agitations less pro less protests that could be done by women and children so a huge number of women were employed employed in cotton related industries mainly in the region of lancashire and yorkshire and children in mining industries the reason being the children being small they could easily go deeper into the mine and they were 
able to open and close the door and work under harsh conditions even without uh, repelling the conditions or the situation so there was a huge amount of child labor that was witnessed it is believed in most of the industrial areas of britain the average life span the average life expectancy or life span of an individual was 14 years 17 years 20 years at the maximum depending on the kind of industrial activity that was done many of the children had their hairs being struck in the machines or their fingers being lost and women had to work in uh, very uh, humiliating situation so there was a lot of uh, we could say child labor that was going in but since there were no child unions no trade unions no child uh, laws that were there the industrialists were free to make people work as many hours as they could so that was the very industrial uh, the very initial period of industrial revolution we'll see how the era of protest started in a while but as we said the children were made to work in very very dangerous situation very very pathetic situation half of the factory workers started job as a child when they were less than 10 years of age so half of the working force in the industries was less than 10 years of age and 28% of the total population was less than 14 years of age. Women were also being given financial independence, the benefits of financial independence and were being asked to work into factory flows for long hours. As a result, they had to sacrifice a lot of them had to sacrifice their child or they had to lose their children. So what was a kind of conflict that started? This period of industrialization was a period that coincided with the French Revolution, the French Renaissance, where the ideas of liberty, equality and fraternity were uh, dwelling. So there was a constant clash that started between England and France. So England and France were at war with each other and it was mainly an ideological war which started from 1792 to 1815 and during this time England and Europe had a trade relation that was totally disrupted. As a result, lot of factories were shut down. The essential items, the prices of the essential items, the essential food commodities jumped up there was large scale unemployment that was witnessed and there were reduction in the daily wages that were given to most of the people. So what was happening was a combination effect. Now combination act was an interesting act which was passed by the parliament in 1795. Under this co uh, combination act it was illegal to incite people to hate the king or the government and not more than 50 people could gather at, the at one time. So what was happening? To hold down the protest among common people, among the laborers, workers, children and women they were trying their best not to allow people to gather because if they gather they'll get, gather strength and they will rebel so in order to curb that rebel they were not allowing people to gather under the combination act and also they were anyone talking wrong about the government or the king was considered as illegal and stringent punishments were given to them there were protests against the prevalent corrupt system that existed in Britain and that was basically linked to monarchy and parliament. The capitalist and the industrial workers, there was two classes that was clearly divided which was the Borgesi and the proletarians and the idea was a huge disparity of rich and poor started to exist and the population who was basically working on the factory floor did not have the right to vote. So whatever elections were taking place in the name of government, in the name of king being uh, appointed were not including the people who were working on the factory floors and as a result the judgment was highly biased. Similarly, it was the time when corn laws were passed. Corn laws was important because it prevented import of cheaper goods from other nations. The growing unemployment 
higher inflation that was witnessed in Britain along with corn laws made the common workers situation much much more pathetic because they were not able to get cheaper food and they were not able to have the basic essential commodity that is food to eat however the rich were able to survive because despite of the higher import prices they were able to buy the commodities at a higher price so what happened was there was a series of protests that started in Britain. The first protest was about the bread and the food riots that started in the 1790s. And that was what we discussed, the corn laws. So the stock of bread was seized by the people and was sold at an affordable price to the industrial workers. However, the industrialists were not happy with it because their sole motive was to charge profit and if the commodity was sold at affordable price to the industrial workers there was no profit being made by them so there was a significant revolt that started firstly with the essential item that was food later on there was issue of enclosures that came in now enclosures was the concept as we discussed where small farms merged into a bigger farm and as a result the landlords became powerful because they had a huge parcel of land and rather than putting men to work they were now putting machines to work because they had a bigger parcel where machines could easily work so they replaced human power with machine power and as a result, uh, the human population that was moved out started to rebel. Similarly, you had weavers who were weaving started to demand a minimum legal wage. They said that we should have at least a minimum legal wage in order to survive. Otherwise, we will have to quit. And they uh, basically revolted by... Uh, showing resistance to spinning and weaving and later on there were a huge amount of protests that took place in Langshire and Derbyshire. The next was the protest in shearing frames. Now so far the sheep were being uh, sheared by the common people or the uh, animal husbanders but later on with the shearing frames coming in this work was replaced by human labor to machines and as a result there was a huge amount of protest among the animal husbandry uh, job that was seen. Similarly, in 1830s, threshing machines came in. So rather than separating the grains from the husk, which was being done manually, threshing machines came in and there was protest for loss of job, rising unemployment that was seen. And Many of the people who were revolting during this time were either hanged or they were sent, sent as convicts to the colonies far in Australia. So anyone who revolts the British rule was picked from the roots and sent to the far off colonies of Australia and other places where Britain had colonized. Next to the threshing machine, which was another series of protests, was a concept which is known as Ludism. This was developed by General Ned Lud. Uh, now, Lud was a journal who, who brought an assault on machines. So, he was the one who participated minimum wage for a labor. He said that the rights of a laborer should be well defined. Women and child should be having specific hours that they should put on to work and there should be right to form trade union where the laws and the rights of the laborers are protected. Later on, this unions became so strong and the, the idea being proposed by uh, General Lud became so strong that there was a Peterloo massacre. Now this Peterloo massacre, the name has been put as Peterloo because it is very similar to what was Waterloo and it took place in uh, 1819 when nearly 80,000 people gathered at St. Peter's Field in Manchester and asked for their rights. They said that they need their rights but this whole population of 80,000 people was suppressed brutally and 
their rights were denied by the six acts now this six acts was the extension of the combination act where for 50 people were not more than 50 people were not allowed to gather and those is speaking hate words against the government or the king were considered as illegal so along with these two combination acts there were further further other restrictions that were put into place and there was a brutal assault that took place on nearly 80000 people who revolted at the st peter's field in manchester after peterloo there was a need for establishment of a common uh, commons representation and therefore there was a further strong drive that led to more protests in britain uh, this was strengthened by liberal political groups that were there and the combination act was finally repealed in 1824 now there was a series of laws that were passed that became very very important in 1819 the first law that was passed prohibited that children under the age of 9 years will not work so less than 9 years were not allowed to work and for women the hours on the factory floor were limited later on in 1833 another set of act was passed where children under 9 were employed only in silk industry which was considered as less hazardous so if a child is below 9 years of age he or she could be employed only in silk industries and no other industries the working hours of the bigger children and women were again restricted and it was made sure that these acts or these laws are enforced stringently later on in 1847 10 hour bill was passed now as the name suggests 10 hour bill which recommended that there would be maximum of 10 hours of work that could be done in and it was after more than 30 years of agitation that this 10 hour bill was passed and women and young children were allowed to work for a maximum period of 10 hours not more than 10 hours but still the situation did not got under control can you think why because all of these laws were applicable to factories but were not applicable to mining sector so huge population was employed into mining children were employed into mines they were forced to go deeper into the mines considering a short Uh, structure that was there and as a result a lot of children lost their lives within the mines itself so there was another act that came in which was the mines and the collieries act in 1842 which prohibited that women under women and children under 10 were not allowed to work in underground areas and later on you had the fiddler factory act which came in 1847 which said children under 18 years and women should not work more than 10 hours a day but despite of all these laws coming in enforcement was a big issue the reason being firstly lot of corruption that existed and secondly parents had a hard time what they did was they willingly showed the child's age as big in order to get an employment for the child so that they could have a bread and butter for their family so rather than let's say the actual age of the child was 8 years they showed that the child was 10 years or 8 10 uh, years so that he or she could get a job and could earn for the family so there was a kind of dual ended problems that started with enforcement firstly on the side of officers where there were corrupt practices the inspectors were poorly paid so they were not at all interested into bringing that into force and they were enjoying their salaries uh, many of the factory managers were bribed so that the real reports are not going out and also as we said the parents were willingly putting the age of their children much bigger than what they actually were so that they could get employed and the family could get a livelihood so that was a real scenario that existed so this whole uh, industrial revolution go had gone through a real gradual process 
and this gradual process was greater concentration of wealth so there was higher disparity that started to develop between the rich and the poor and also as we said it was not a universal phenomena across Britain within Britain regional disparities emerged there were pockets where lots and lots of development started and other pockets uh, other pockets and other areas of Britain went empty so there was no industrial development no uh, development that was witnessed so iron cotton engineering industries accounted for less than half of the total outputs in 1840s and it also uh, a proportion went to agriculture and pottery center uh, then you had growth in the trade that started because there was mass production coming up so definitely Britain needed to had markets and for that there was nothing better than the colonies of Britain the region where Britain had colonized and as a result there was a significant growth in the trade that was seen. You had a series of French war and Napoleon wars that were seen. So French revolution and Napoleon wars changed the mindset of the people towards liberty, equality and fraternity and as a result gave rise to numerous protests that started during the time of industrial revolution and as we said the population was divided into two class the borgesi and the poly uh proletarians and therefore capital formation became one of the major aims so there was a real debate as to whether this industrial revolution brought a real revolution in the life of people or it just increased the rate of unemployment increased the rate of disparity and inequality between the masses so that was the basic idea about industrial revolution that we have studied we would be covering many more interesting lectures in history. Stay tuned. Have a wonderful day ahead.